I'd like to introduce uh, Josh Kaffer, who's a UW faculty member and a certified wildlife biologist. And, uh, and in addition, he has wrote uh, just, just completed an amazing uh, resource book on uh, herpetology, herpetology in, in Wisconsin. And uh, we're raffling that off tonight. So if you stay to the end, uh, you can win a signed book by Josh and really appreciate that. 9.8 pounds. It's uh, 9.8 pounds. It is well worth the, uh, the read. So it is a tremendous resource book. And so a uh, little story, Josh and I know known each other for a long time and uh, we have gone on the field together. And the one time I remember vividly, we were on the shore of Lulu Lake and someone yells, snake. So my first reaction, of course, is to back away. I, I see this blur going over my head, diving into the water, uh, and Josh comes out with a snake. So that's what it's like working with Josh in the field. So uh, with that, uh, thanks for coming. And Josh is he's wounded, but he still made it. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. If you just click that arrow there, you will look at this. Okay, great. That's right. Excellent. You might have to double click that first time. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate the introduction, Tom, very much. And so today I'm going to talk generally about amphibian and reptile conservation. Uh, and then I'm going to give you some case examples that are unique to Wisconsin, but related to a couple of species that are particularly rare. Here we've got a smattering of different species found here in the state. Um, most of the species on this slide are considered rare or imperiled, and we'll come back to that in a second. But before we start talking about that, I think it's useful to really briefly discuss the general diversity of amphibians and reptiles here in Wisconsin. So compared to a place like North Carolina, Louisiana, Florida, we have a moderate to low diversity. We don't have huge numbers of species. So if we look at the breakdown, it is 12 frogs and toads, seven salamanders, four lizards, 11 turtles, 23 snakes. Not a ton of different species, especially again, if you compare to those most Southern regions. However, what I like to point to is the fact that here in Wisconsin, we may not have a massive diversity of species, but what we do have are organisms that have had to adapt to a wide range of conditions because of where our state is located geographically and the types of different habitats and environments available to them. So here in Wisconsin, we don't have a huge species diversity or a massive species richness, but we do have organisms with a large breadth of adaptations to different conditions, which is makes them very interesting, at least it does to me anyways. And so if we look at Wisconsin and the breakdown of some of our different, oh, that gets cut off at the top, doesn't it? Ecological provinces and sections, that says. Up top, we have the Laurentia mixed forest. Down below, we have the Midwest broadleaf forest. And then breaking these up are different ecological sections, such as the, uh, there you go, Tom, thank you such as the Southwestern Great Lakes Moreno, the Wisconsin Central Sand, the Western Superior Uplands, et cetera. With each of these sections comes different environmental conditions and a breadth of different habitats that the organisms have to deal with. So we have a huge sort of mix of hot, dry prairie, northern forest, southern forest, large wetlands, small wetlands, large rivers, large lakes, streams, ponds, and so on and so forth. And so not only do they have all of these different conditions across these different sections to deal with, they also have to deal with the fact that being cold-blooded or ectothermic, they've got to survive the winter. So they have all of these adaptations to put up with these conditions and survive in them. And that's what makes them particularly interesting, not so much that there are many, many, many of them. Now, I'd mentioned those imperiled species before. This slide shows just the endangered species in the state and actually, this is a ribbon snake. There are two species of ribbon snake, but they look very similar to each other. So I just used the one picture. So we have seven endangered amphibian and or reptile in the state, right? And really we only have one endangered amphibian, and that is the cricket frog. But you've got the Massasauga in the upper right, you've got the queen snake, 
the two ribbon snakes, the slender glass lizard, even though that looks like a snake, it's a lizard. And down below is the ornate box turtle, a fully terrestrial turtle species here in Wisconsin. So we look at this and say, all right, this doesn't look like it's that bad, right? There's only six species or seven species, I'm sorry, that are imperiled, endangered, in fact, here in Wisconsin. But when we put the threatened special concern protected species on this slide, it starts to get more crowded. Now we have a larger number of species that we would consider imperiled here in the state. What we have to remember about those designations, endangered, you know, threatened, special concern protected, those have to be approved by legislature. So whether or not a species needs to be protected sometimes is irrelevant if it doesn't get through the legislature, right? Even though something should be protected, maybe everybody thinks it should be ecologically, it still might not happen. So the fact that we have this many that have been designated as special concern, threatened or endangered is a testament to how many imperiled species we have here in the state. And if we look at the breakdown, we can, hold on, there we go. We look at the breakdown, amphibians up top, you can see that 37% of our amphibians in the state are listed as endangered or special concern. 42% of the reptiles are listed as either endangered, threatened or special concern protected. So large proportion of, even though we don't have that many species, a large proportion of those are considered and designated as endangered, threatened, or special concern. In other words, they're imperiled in some way or another, right? So that's problematic. We have not a lot of species, but we have a lot that are imperiled somehow or another. So what are the reasons why organisms like this become imperiled? Well, there's many different threats that the amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin face. When think over harvesting would be a big issue because they're not white-tailed deer and they're not musky and they're not game fish, but every person in this room is probably, or just about, at least the ones that are over 30 years old, have probably dissected frogs when they were in school. Those were all wild caught, right? Very few of those are bred in captivity. So over harvesting, thousands and thousands and thousands of leopard frogs have been collected over time for biological supply use like that. We have the threat of human persecution, right? The threat of uh, direct killings. Amphibians and reptiles are frequently considered maybe a little bit gross, scary, slimy, blah, 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 whatever. So people don't like them, right? And they'll kill them on site sometimes, unfortunately. But with the case of two of our species, the two rattlesnakes, we had an active bounty on those two species until the 70s. So they were actively sought out and killed for money, which is a lot different than just killing them because you don't like them, it means that lots of them got killed, had huge impacts on both of those species here in the state. We also have pollution, which is something you've talked about a lot here at the summit. We have other problematic species. When it comes to reptiles in particular, we have these synanthropic species like raccoons or species that do well in areas disturbed by humans, which is most of Southern Wisconsin. And raccoons do really well around people and raccoons like to eat turtle nests and dig up, or dig up turtle nests and eat the eggs. So they have a big impact on turtle population. And then there are the indirect impacts of invasive species. Oftentimes we think about invasive plants, degrading habitat quality, right? So the plants don't directly kill the amphibians and reptiles, but they indirectly do through modification of habitat. There is also then disease, which has, especially in the last couple of decades, something that's gotten a lot of attention paid to it when it comes to amphibians and or reptiles. Kitchard funguses. Funguses have become a real big problem lately with a lot of these critters. Kitchard fungus, salamander kitchard, snake fungal disease, there are rhinoviruses, all of these things have increased in intensity and prevalence, we think, over the last several decades. And then finally, the number one reason why anything becomes imperiled or potentially goes extinct is threats to habitat. That threat to habitat can be destruction, obviously, but it can also be fragmentation, which we'll come back to. It can also be just simple degradation. You're degrading the quality of it. You didn't turn it into a parking lot, but you degraded its quality over time. So this alone is what is the number one reason why species decline and go extinct globally, right? There's no question about that, right? There's mountains of evidence to support that's true. So we need to think about this in the context of, or at least I like to think about it, in the context of Wisconsin, which is where I do most of my work. If we look at the distribution of habitats across the state, estimated from the mid-1800s, you can see lots of red. The red represents forest, a lot of green. The green represents grassland and shrublands, lots of dark blue, wetlands, right? 
very little of the yellow, which is the working land, and very little of the gray, which is developed land. The working land being agricultural land. We jump ahead, 2006. This is now almost 20 years old, but you can see massive shift, right? This probably doesn't surprise anybody in this room, but I am always surprised when I look at it to say, my God, look at all the loss of habitat available to everything, not just amphibians and reptiles, conversion over for anthropogenic purposes. So massive losses of habitat over time. So the loss of habitat, clearly critical to our, uh, the conservation of our species here, or it's a big cause of decline in our species here, but it's more than just the straight loss of habitat by the way, I didn't want to hawk the book, but this figure comes from my book, so take a look. <laughs> so um, if we take a look at amphibians and reptiles in particular when it comes to habitat, they have a couple of real, real problems. They're very connected to their habitat first because they're cold-blooded. So they're very connected, I should say, to their environmental conditions. So changes in temperature, changes in something related to temperature and moisture levels, they're very, very connected to that and they're influenced by it heavily because they're so, so very limited in their ability to stave off changes in temperature, changes in moisture levels. But organisms like amphibians and reptiles, generally speaking, like complex habitats and they have complex habitat needs. So there's a couple of ways we can think about this. First of all, generally speaking, they are all, or many of them, have multiple habitat types they require to achieve their life history goals annually. They don't just need one habitat type, in other words, they need multiple habitat types. So there's lots of different examples we can think of for this, with species requiring at least two habitats to meet their needs on an annual basis. And if they can't get access to those two habitats, then they are not successful. Maybe they don't die, but maybe they don't achieve reproductive success, right? Which means over time, the population declines. So the clearest example of this would be the need to have both wetlands and uplands. And we think about this very easily when we consider the life stage of amphibians, like the blue spotted salamander. Everybody in here learned about metamorphosis when they were kids. Metamorphosis, these animals have, you know, a need to be in an aquatic environment because they are fully aquatic when they're juveniles, then they transfer, become fully terrestrial or at least partially terrestrial adults at some point in their life. So they need both of those habitats, right? They need intact wetlands, they need intact uplands, so that they can, can complete their life cycle, right? Here in Wisconsin, then we have a connection between, or we have two habitats related to season, I should say. They have their overwintering habitat that they need intact, and they have their active season ha habitat that they need intact. If they don't have a place to spend the winter, they won't survive the winter here. And this is actually one of the reasons why certain snake species don't end up this far west, or I'm sorry, east in Wisconsin. Your bull snakes, your timber rattlesnakes, those types of things, need rock crevices that go below the frost line. We don't have those here, but they have them in the Wisconsin and Mississippi River Valley. So we see those species over there, not here. But we have these needs. If those organisms don't have those needs met, then they can't persist, right? We think about, or at least I like to think too, about turtles. Turtles are really, really interesting because they have to survive the winter. So they need a wetland or a pond or a water body that won't freeze solid. They can freeze on top, but it can't freeze solid. If it freezes solid, they're more likely to die. But then the rest of the year, they can hang out in shallow wetlands that in the winter might freeze, but in the summer are shallow and very productive. So they have these two different things they need and they need connections between them. And this is really critical because people will frequently say, well, we protected this wetland, right? I don't, what do these things need? There's a wetland here. There's an upland right there. What do they need? Well, in between those two, if there is also this massive road with huge numbers of frogs getting turned into goo on it, not great, right? It's not an intact connection between those two habitats. Doesn't work out, right? So not only do they need the two habitats, they also need intact connections between those two habitats to maintain their survival, maintain population sizes. So this is a really complex issue because they have so many different needs that need to be met. And that means they're hard to manage, they're hard to develop conservation strategies for. So I said we were gonna talk about some case examples. So I'm gonna talk about some species that are associated with aquatic habitat, wetland and stream habitat that we would find here in Southeastern Wisconsin, or at least historically would have been. And the first of which that I'm gonna talk about is the Massasauga, right? So the Eastern Massasauga, for those that don't know, is one of our two venomous snake species in the state. 
Uh, this one is endangered in Wisconsin, right? But it is also federally threatened. So it is listed at the federal and the state level. And it's not a really big rattlesnake. It's pretty small, right? Like coiled up, it's probably the size of a dinner plate. So it's in the quote pygmy rattlesnake group. It's not a great big Western diamondback or something like that. So historically, when we look at the records or at least the anecdotal information about Massasagas in southeastern Wisconsin and in parts of central and southern Wisconsin, there's a real picture being painted of an organism that existed in massive abundance, right? Endangered now, but existed in massive abundance. So this is a quote from Thomas Kenny. He published this in 1827 and he was talking about a place in Columbia County. He says, the whole country is full of them. So constant is the noise of their rattles that the ear is kept half the time deceived by what seems to be the ticking of watches in a watchmaker's window. So, so many rattlesnakes in an area that it sounded to him like he was sitting in a watchmaker's shop because the rattles were so constant. So many, right? Tons and tons of rattlesnakes is what that would suggest. Another one, this is by Olin. He's re uh, recounting an account from Milwaukee area in the 1830s. He says, the first day we mowed, we killed a quantity of rattlesnakes. I will not say a thousand for fear someone will think it a snake story. So in a short period of time, mowing an area, killing hundreds of rattlesnakes during that time. Now, surely some of those could have been misidentified water snakes or something like that. But when you see a rattlesnake and you hear a rattlesnake, you know it's a rattlesnake. And so these people had lots of opportunities to see and hear rattlesnakes. So they probably at least had some of this correct, maybe not exactly correct, but some of it. So massive abundance, right? Or at least the implication of massive abundance. Today in danger, what happened, right? Well, there's a couple of things that we like to point to when we wanna think about what happened. And in this case, I first like to talk about that bounty I mentioned before. So the bounty in Wisconsin lasted for many decades and it just, it was terminated in the 70s, right? So it's been around for, or it had been around for quite some time. And it, it's hard to know exactly how many snakes were killed by the bounty because it was sort of a county by county basis that uh, it was tracked. So individual counties would pay out a bounty per rattlesnake tail, right? Including the tails of babies. So two things that meant people wanted to focus on pregnant females because you'd have the adult female's tail that you could turn in and you could cut off all those baby rattlesnake tails in her belly, get even more money. So there was a tendency to focus on gravid females. Not great for populations when you're eliminating all of your reproductive individuals, right? Especially reproductive individuals of one sex. But we do have some records that some counties took better records than others. And Dick Thiel, who used to work, maybe still works for the DNR, I think he's retired, Lisa, you can probably correct me. But Dick Thiel had uh, compiled information about bounties paid out in a four township area, not the entire county, but a four township area in Juneau County. Now, this location is unlikely to have timber rattlesnakes because of the habitat. So these were probably all Massasaga. So in a 10 year period, they paid out over 4,200 bounties on rattlesnakes that were probably Massasaugas. So that's a large number. But what Dick also found was that in the subsequent years, that number got smaller and smaller and smaller until there were almost none, right? So over time, we start off with this massive number, got a bunch of them we killed and got rid of, and then duh, 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 fewer and fewer until they were gone. So real rapid decline, starting with a large number. So persecution can come in many different fashions. It can come in many different ways. We often think about people who don't like snakes, persecuting snakes, because that's what comes to mind first. I saw a snake in my, this is oftentimes a picture I get sent of a dead snake. What was it? What happened to it? Well, I killed it. Okay, let's start there, I guess. Don't kill the snake next time. You can still take a picture of it when it's alive, I suspect. I mean, not a tech genius, but. So persecution is a problem in general, okay? Here's a great example from way back, 68. There was a guy named Keenline. He published a thesis for the University of Minnesota and he was working in Wisconsin on Massasaugas, right? And so for his thesis to study the ecology of Massasaugas, he killed 323 adults and he killed 207 young. Now, you say, why would this ecologist kill all these snakes if he's studying these snakes? And his reasoning is more ecological information will be necessary if for some reason it is found necessary to eradicate it as a menace to human life or to manage it as a sport animal. So 
you know, not great when your ecologists are killing off huge numbers of snakes so they can figure out how to kill more snakes, uh, especially when they're maybe considering it a sport animal. The only thing I can do is laugh about it because it's so depressing to think, I don't know, maybe someday we'll try shooting rattlesnakes as a sport animal. I don't know, we'll just get rid of them. So coming from many different directions is the problem here for the Massasauga. People that don't like snakes are killing them. People that like nature are killing them. So problematic. It's not a surprise that they went away or declined massively in number. So we put that on top of the huge degree of habitat fragmentation and habitat loss that's happened for this species. And we start to see, or we start to understand how easily something that was once so common became so rare, right? So massive amounts of fragmentation and habitat loss, like I showed you before, that's easy for us to get our heads around a little bit. Yeah, of course, when you get rid of wetlands, things that live in wetlands don't have anywhere to go. But there are more subtle impacts that we can also consider when we're thinking about habitat loss. We can think about habitat loss or degradation through alterations of something like the water level or the water table. Massasaugas tend to overwinter at this, they, they overwinter in crayfish burrows, and they do so at the interface where the water level is. So if the water level is going up and down inside of a crayfish burrow, they're following that. They don't, they can't be exposed, they'll freeze. The water level goes down too far, then they can't get below the frost anymore, and they also freeze. So if we have water levels that are being adjusted over the winter in particular, or early spring, late fall, this is problematic because as that water level recedes, if there's nowhere to get to, then they're exposed to ice, potentially freeze. If we get high water levels in the winter, they get driven out, then they potentially freeze as well. So being conscious of this when we're thinking about how we're altering water levels along riparian corridors is important, not just to Massasaugas, but to many, many different species. Because, you know, think about this. Well, we're going to dam this up or we're going to draw this down for waterfall production or something. And then we expose these organisms in the winter and it ends up killing them. Right? So there's a lot of different factors we need to consider when we're trying to conserve things like sagas. So what's next? Well, this is really a challenge for this species here in the state because there is a lot more information required. Despite all the attention that's been paid to them, it's really, really hard to study things like the Wisconsin population dynamics, the effects of climate change, best management practices. They're incredibly difficult to study because there's not that many of them. So I have spent many hours at Massasauga sites and found one, two, none, right? So you can spend lots of time looking for Massasaugas and not find enough to constitute a study where you can learn something about population dynamics. So they're very difficult to work with because they're so rare in part, right? Aside from notwithstanding that they're venomous and all that, right? They're very difficult to work with. So it's hard for us to say, well, we're just gonna go out and figure out the rest of it and then we can conserve them. It's not that easy. So there's a lot of challenges facing this species. Now, I could go on about sagas because they're one of my favorites. I love rattlesnakes. I know, I'm weird. So Blanding's turtle is the next one I want to talk about. It's another wetland species that we would find here in southeastern Wisconsin today. The Blanding's turtle or Emidoidea blandingi is really cool because it's one of our only actual, kind of not obligate, but it hangs out primarily in wetland habitat, right? Your painted turtles, your snapping turtles, they'll hang out in every kind of aquatic habitat that you can find pretty much. Blinding turtles really like wetlands or maybe wetlands along the periphery of big lakes or maybe if there's a wetland area in the backwaters of a river, they like wetland habitat. So what that means is that they like wetlands. Wetlands are one of those habitats that are imperiled here in the upper Midwest, but problematic for the Blinding's turtle is that they don't just want one wetland, they need complexes of many wetlands that are connected to each other, right? So they like to, as we call it, pond hop, right? They go from this one and then they go to that one way over there and then they go to that one way over there and then they come back to this one. And they're doing this over land movements to get to these different wetlands. So they need some shallow wetlands that are really productive for foraging in the summer where you get high production of invertebrates that they can feed on. But they also need large deep water wetlands that have or that aren't gonna freeze solid in the winter so that they can spend the winter there. And then on top of that, they need the connections between those two. So they need these different wetlands and they need to have a connection between these different wetlands so they can get to where they're going, right? So yeah, they'll stay in one wetland if they got nowhere else they can get to, but what they really wanna do is move across to all these different wetlands that exist on a landscape that's well connected. This is a map showing 
uh, 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 home ranges for several blindings turtles we were tracking a number of years ago. All of the different colors are different habitat types. These black sort of outlined uh, shapes are the movement patterns of individual blindings turtles that we track. So you can see many of them are going across huge distances. They're going from that pond to that pond, this pond over to here, we're going all the way down to this location. So they're going all over the place. They're pond hopping to all of these different spots. Not any of them hang out in just one pond their entire life. I'll tell you, these individuals had small home ranges only because they died before we could, uh, before they got a chance to move around. So they have these needs where they're moving across these large landscapes. They need the connections between those. So what are some of the con uh, considerations for uh, habitat management that we could think about with Blanding's turtles? Well, Blanding's turtles need, uh, uh, we need to maintain hydrology for them. Again, this sort of like moving water up and down in the winter is really problematic. There was a study in Minnesota, I think it was in the 90s, where they drew water down to produce or to uh, improve waterfowl habitat. And they ended up killing a huge number of turtles and many of them were blinding turtles. They exposed them in the winter and they froze to death, right? So problematic, right? It, it's really, it's problematic when you're trying to do something good for one species and you end up killing another. That's really a problem, right? So we gotta come up with a better way than, than to do things like that. But also to maintain wetland complexes where there's many different wetlands that they can get access to with connections between those. Uh, I ain't gonna lie, this is a tall order, right? I'm not saying that we can do this tomorrow because oftentimes this is gonna require not just public land, but private land, right? It's troublesome, it's hard, it's not easy, right? So yeah, definitely something that needs to be considered for this organism. Creating variable landscapes in general is always something I recommend when we're talking about herb conservation. Heterogeneous landscapes, lots of variation, nothing homogenized, right? They like cover, they like structure, they like variable landscapes. That's critical and important to many of the species uh, here in Wisconsin and globally, in fact. So the last case study, I think I have time, yeah, the last case study I wanna talk about is the queen snake. This is another one we have here in Southeastern Wisconsin. It is considered endangered and the queen snake again, is one of these organisms that we just don't know a whole lot about. It's endangered, it's very rare, we know some things about its ecology, but we don't have a lot of information to make really, really good management decisions with, right? This is true of others, the two others that always come to mind when I'm thinking about species we need more information on, in addition to the queen snake, the two ribbon snake species, I, we almost know nothing about them. In fact, one of them the Western ribbon snake, I don't know if anybody has actually seen one of those in many, many years. They're really, really hard to find. The glass lizard I mentioned before, even though it looks like a snake, it's a lizard. That one, we just, we don't know much about them. They're hard to find. There's not many of them to study with, so it's hard to come up with studies for these types of organisms. What we do know about queen snakes in particular is that they like riparian corridors, specific, specifically streams, apparently streams that are fast moving or quick current, that have little siltation, that also have cold, clear water, right? So that's sort of the narrative that this species really likes here uh, in the upper Midwest. So we're looking for something that is already in trouble, right? A habitat that's already in trouble. Anybody who does work with trout knows, right? That that's a habitat that struggles to sort of maintain itself and not get degraded. But we're talking about not just the streams, but also very specific qualities of those streams for this organism. So. They are obligate, I'm sorry, they eat only crayfish and they eat only freshly molted crayfish to the best of our knowledge. So they need a very specific habitat type and a very specific food type. That's always a recipe for disaster for an organism that needs conservation. If they have very specific needs, that one thing, just like I tell my college students, the one thing goes away, they're gone, right? So this is problematic for the queen snake. Now, when we think of queen snakes and we think of habitat management, again, we're making the best judgment guesses we can because hard data on these organisms is lacking, right? So we make the best guesses we can and we think about management of riparian corridors. Now we're talking specifically about queen snakes here. So there are other organisms that you know, might have ideas that compete with this, but I'm talking just about queen snakes right now. We need permanent streams for queen snakes, right? We also, this is really where things start to get a little bit tricky is that these permanent streams what limited data we have on movement for queen snakes suggests they don't move that far from the stream edge, right? So any impacts close to that water interface are gonna potentially impact queen snakes. They can't just go away somewhere else. They don't like to do that, right? They don't like to leave that stream corridor. 
And so that buffer, I'm sorry, before I go on, that buffer is believed to be about 25 meters, right? That's what limited info we have is if you're, you know, 25 meters of the water interface, that's the zone where these queen snakes like to hang out the most. The other problem is that they need open streams, but that are also shrubby because they like to hang out on shrubs that overhang the water. They need to get sunlight penetrating that so that they can thermoregulate or they can warm themselves up. So they can't have trees, right? Over canopy, overhead canopy stuff, that's not good. So it's like they need this shrubs with a 50% or less canopy coverage. So in other words, they have really specific needs, really problematic to say, okay, we're gonna manage the site and we're gonna cut down so there's 50% coverage and then we're gonna leave shrubs that'll turn into a problem later, but whatever, we just gotta do some. So it's really hard to come up with something. Things that reduce runoff, because you can imagine organisms that like to hide under rocks looking for crayfish. If those get heavily silted in, that seems like it would be a problem. I've found them at sites. I found them along Turtle Creek, which has a lot of siltation in spots, but I'm just sort of wondering if those were individuals forced to hang out there. So generally speaking, lots of challenges for these types of organisms and they highlight the struggles of amphibian and reptile conservation here in wisconsin right these are just a couple of the species that we could talk about and spend many many hours discussing so with that i think i'm going to stop and let people ask questions i've got like seven minutes left right okay tom's nodding so i think that's correct otherwise i'll keep talking We only have the one. It's the slender glass lizard. The one that you saw in North Carolina was probably the eastern glass lizard. So that one is not here. Um, which really, I, I don't have a range map for them, but what's interesting about them too is that their range, as we currently know it in the upper Midwest, goes up into like the middle of Illinois. Then there's this huge gap, and then they show up in central Wisconsin again. So we don't know why that is, but really, a, they're a cool, cool critter. Yeah, they yeah. And they move really fast. They do. They're incredibly hard to catch. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Um, in areas where a grove bisects a habitat, mm -hmm. um, are there infrastructure changes that can be made to allow the, um, the animals to move from one habitat to another? Yeah, the question was if there's a road bisecting two habitats, is it possible that infrastructure could be? Sort of, or infrastructure could somehow allow for a connection to be made. And it does happen uh, if there is a, so for example, if there are road updates that have to happen and those areas have been identified as a place where amphibians and reptiles get killed, uh, frequently crossing the roads, then DOT, and Lisi would know more about this than I would, DOT has been really good with working with the DNR and coming up with underpasses and things like that in those locations. Um, but you know, you can't, the difficult part is you can't just say, well, let's dig this road up and put an underpass because there's a bunch of dead amphibians getting killed on the road, unfortunately. Um, it usually takes, well, we need to update this road, so we're going to go ahead and then put the underpasses in as well. But it does happen. Yeah. So how, how do you try to identify those areas? Well, the DNR has a website where they track crossing things like crossing turtles. In fact, there's a, there was a, a, a pamphlet that's out there um, where you can report uh, road mortality of things like turtles, for example. And they take that, they track that information to determine where the highest volume of locations and sightings are. And then also you tracking it, keeping track of it yourself and reporting it um, is helpful as well. Um, the, like, uh, I, you know, I can give you the names of some people to contact for stuff like that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that frogs uh, are good for keeping control of insects. Do snakes do that? Well, well do they, eat a lot of they do eat a lot of insects. Nobody has ever actually that I have ever seen quantify the impact on insect populations that snakes have. But well, you're a herpetologist, but, so that is true that it has a huge impact on bugs with frogs. Because amphibians in particular eat lots of insects. Now again, so I have had this argument with uh, entomology folks that I knew when I was an undergraduate, right? Or when I was in uh, graduate school. And I would say, look at these salamanders, right? A salamander larva eats, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of mosquito larva per day while it's in those wetlands, just sucking up mosquito larva. So that has to have a huge impact on local mosquito populations. And an entomologist looked at me and says, they have kajillions of baby. It doesn't have any impact in blah, blah, blah. So there have been studies that have found it does cause some curbing of those populations. Little doubt in that. Now, what the sort of meaningful level of that is, I couldn't say. 
Now where snakes have a bigger impact is with rodent populations, right? So not our garter snakes and the queen snakes and stuff, but the rattlers like the timber rattler, the bull snake, the milk snake, which we have down here, they have a big impact on rodent populations more so than insects. Yeah. I was just gonna ask more about the frogs too, and ask if you could just speak a little to our endangered frog species up there and its needs and its threats just a little bit. Yeah. So the Blanchard's cricket frog is our endangered frog. And so that one has, a, it's another example of specific habitat needs. Its decline has really sort of showed up in the 70s, right? That's when the decline really started. And it's kind of enigmatic. We don't have a really good grasp on why it's declined so rapidly. We think that it's related to specifically overwintering habitat because they have very specific overwintering needs. So. Some frog, this is a frog species, the, the Blanchard's cricket frog, it can't remain submerged all winter, right? So like your bullfrogs, your green frogs, they just hang out under the water all winter, right? Cricket frogs can't do that. They can't, they can't, they'll, they'll suffocate, right? Some frogs that hang out on land, uh, more like your tree frogs, your wood frog, they can actually resist freezing because they produce a glycerol-based substance that helps offset ice crystals forming in their skin and all that stuff. So, Cricket frogs can't do that either. So what they need is this sweet spot in between where they're kind of at, again, usually associated with the water level moving up and down inside of a crevice along a sort of a, a, a bank, right? And when that happens, they can follow that and they can avoid freezing, right? As long as they don't get driven too high up or get driven too far down and the water gets, or they get exposed and freeze. So those types of habitats we think have been declining. And because of that, cricket frogs have declined, right? But we don't really know for sure because they haven't, you know, all we know is they've declined in massive numbers. I mean, if you look at the reports of them, this area was covered with cricket frogs, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, covered with cricket frogs. And now, I don't know, there's a couple of places and there's one I know in Waukesha County, I think, and they're almost completely gone. They were once considered the most common frog in Southern Wisconsin. And they're now, so yeah, enigmatic. Yeah. I'm curious to uh, turtles, and I'm thinking particularly king bed and snapping turtles. Do the individual turtles return to the same spots to lay their eggs? They absolutely do. Yeah, there's pretty good evidence that that happens. Now, how they hone in on those originally is still a little bit up for debate. It could be that juveniles imprint on that and then come back, right, after they've sort of hatched out themselves. But individuals frequently come back to the same spot. Loss of nesting habitat for turtles is a big problem as well because encroachment of vegetation, it gets shaded, it doesn't have the same thermal properties. And also those tiny little areas that are good, turtles focus on those, but so do raccoons, right? So there's just, it's like, it's almost depressing to talk about. There's all, it's from all sides, right? Amphibians and reptiles are good. That's what I asked because I've had, I believe the turtles uh, Sure. Yeah, I believe it. I completely believe it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, if I still have time, yeah. Uh, you mentioned I got two minutes. Queen snake habitat. The first two miles downstream from Lake Geneva on the White River sounds exactly. Yeah. Is it possible to reintroduce species? Well, so this is the sort of classic argument, especially with amphibians and reptiles. People have frequently said, why don't we just captive breed them and then re release them? current evidence of the success of those types of studies is very mixed. If you release them as juveniles, they seem to do better in some species. If you release them as adults, they don't do as well. We need to be sure, be sure the things that cause them to decline in the first place are gone. We need to know that there's sufficient overwintering habitat. That's really critical. They might do fine during the active season and then have nowhere to overwinter and then they're done. So it's it's possible, but the, the jury is really out on the effectiveness of that for amphibians and reptiles. Very, very mixed results so far. I think I must be out of time now, but if anybody has questions, they can ask me later too. You're welcome. And now,